Hello folks and welcome to the Mathematics of the Bridge Game. Uh, today we're looking at the probability of surviving uh, the bridge game in the fantastic Netflix series Squid Game. Uh, there are 16 players remaining in the game and they have to cross a bridge made up of 18 nodes as we'll call them. At each node there are two panes of glass to choose from to stand. One is made of tempered glass and will hold your weight. The other is made of real glass and will break if someone stands on it. So uh, to do the maths we are going to make a few assumptions. Uh, the first is that all the players play quickly. We're going to assume that everyone plays fairly and no one can die by accident. And we're going to assume, and this is an important one, we're going to assume that all remaining players in the game have perfect memory of how much of the bridge has been solved so far. We're also going to assume that the tempered glass and the real glass patterns are chosen perfectly randomly. We're also assuming that no player has any special talent or ability over any other player. All are equally skilled. Uh, and we're also going to assume that choosing real glass uh, will always mean certain death. It's not like it can maybe start cracking and you can quickly leap off it if you see that you, you've you chosen it wrong. All right, so what are the questions we're trying to answer? Firstly and foremostly, what are the probabilities for each individual player to survive the game from player 1 through to player 16? Secondly, can we generalize the solution for any number of players? We'll call it M players in an N node game. And finally, can we generalize for the probability of surviving uh, a, a particular step to be different than a half? All right, so let's get started. Poor old player one. Uh, this one's the easiest and most trivial to figure out. Uh, this uh, unfortunate soul has to traverse 18 uh, separate decisions uh, in a row and guess correctly 18 times in a row. So his chances of surviving are in the region of 1 in 300,000-ish. Um, exceptionally unlikely that this poor chap is going to live. His main job is to just try to do his best and solve as much of the puzzle as he can. Already though we can start to generalize, instead of writing 18, we're going to write n for the number of nodes, and instead of writing 0 0.5, we're going to write little p. Okay, so that's player one. Let's have a look at player two, uh, played by this lady in the, um, in the show itself. And here this is a, an, an important uh, separation we're going to make between uh, the two, two scenarios for player two. There are two different paths via which uh, player two can live. The first is that player one miraculously lived and showed her the way and she has no decisions to make at all other than to memorize the pattern and follow what player one did. We're gonna call that case A. The second and far more likely scenario in the case of player two is that player one died somewhere uh, on node K and we're gonna solve each of these two cases separately and then glue the probabilities together because they are uh, obviously distinct. Player one uh, has either lived or died and there's no other uh, potential possibility for player one. So in case A, we simply carry forward the probability that player one lived, which is P to the N, uh, or as we saw before, 0 0.5 to the power of 18. So we'll put that, that to one side. We can think of case A as the free roll. It's kind of the, the free gift that player one gives to player two. Um, in the context of them living. They also give a far greater gift in the context of them dying, which is uh, what we will calculate in case B. So the probability of being in this exact position as player two is equal to the probability of player one dying at exactly node K, okay? And player two then has 18 minus K decisions left to make. Okay, so what is the probability that player two goes on to live after player one died at node K? Well, we can work that out by simply multiplying uh, here, if you can see where I'm pointing my mouse, p to the n minus k is the rest of her journey. And this is the probability that player one in square brackets got her here in the first place. There are, this is all f f well and good for calculating what is the probability for player two living given that player one died on node k, but there are 18 different nodes that, or n different distinct nodes for player one to have died on. So the number of different possibilities statistically for player two to live and player one to die is simply 18 times whatever uh, the particular result for one of the nodes is. That does change as we go up the uh, list of players and uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Now cases A and B are mutually exclusive, exclusive as I said before, player one has either lived or died, not both uh, and not neither. So we can apply simple addition with the probabilities and we can calculate this formula. When you plug in the uh, value of n equals 18 and p equals 0 0.5, you get this value here, 0.00725%, which is 19 times more likely than uh, poor old player one. However, is still astronomically unlikely. Uh, she has less than a 1 in 10,000 chance of survival. 
Player 3 is where things do get very, very interesting, and it's from Player 3 onwards that I've been able to derive a general formula for any player. So again, but we're going to use the same structure. We're going to start with two possibilities. The first is that player two uh, miraculously lives. So we are going to take the probability from player two and carry it forward into case A. Of course, player three, this probably isn't the case. Probably both players that went before him are dead. Case B, same again as what we saw before. Okay, so similar structure to what we talked about before with player two. Let's have a look, and I've drawn a makeshift uh, diagram here to sort of illustrate this point. Uh, the conundrum for player three, standing at node K. The probability that player three lives in this scenario is uh, shown here below. Uh, you've got here p to the n minus k, if we work our way from this side, this is the work that player 3 still has to do. But how did we get here? Well, player 1 uh, died on node 1, there he is at 1 minus p, and then player 2 did k minus 2, correct guesses, that's 4 correct guesses followed by an incorrect guess on the node we're standing on. Okay. Now, here's the thing, there are k minus 1 different distinct nodes for uh, player 1 to have died on. Yes, player 2 certainly died here on node k, when we are restricting ourselves to node k. But if we begin to generalise away from node 1 for player 1, we see that uh, there are actually k minus 1 different places he could have died, anywhere from 1 to 5 in the example. So in order to get rid of the p1 died at node 1 and generalise for all of the different uh, nodes in which player 1 could have died on this journey, we simply have to add them all up. So there are five of these in this example. In other words, we multiply our formula by k minus 1 to count up all of the combinations of events that lead to player 3 standing and starting the game at node k and then going on to win. Okay, uh, so an important uh, result from this is that uh, as player three's game begin, if if player three's game begins later, uh, he has more. There are more combinations in which his game begins later, and he goes on to live. Uh, again, not to be confused with the fact that in reality he's starting from node three or four or five almost all the time, and he's almost always dying. Don't confuse that with the um, counting of scenarios in which player 3 lives. All right, there are, however, n different values of k. Uh, so we need to move player 3 along. He could be starting on any one of these 18 nodes, and we're going to need to add up all the probability contributions from all 18. So instead of, uh, while we're at it, we're also going to replace k minus 1 with k minus 1 choose 1. It might seem trivial and stupid to do that, but we're going to use it later when we come to generalise for player 4, 5, 6, and 7, and, and so on. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to add up all of the values of k um, where player 3 is starting his game from using our formula. Now, uh, to double down on what I said before, when player 2 died on node 18, there are 17 different ways that player 1 died, so this becomes a 17 by contrast, when player, when player 2 di di dies on node 2, there's actually only one combination. There are not 17 ways that player 3 uh, finds himself winning in that scenario. There's only one way he finds himself winning, which is that he has to do all the work as opposed to having any help from his um, predecessors. So that's an important result, is that player 3 can never begin the game on node 1, because player 1 will certainly... Uh, player 1 or 2 will certainly... Um, have lived uh, on node 1. Okay, so let's have a look at, let's close out player 3 and generalize for player j. Uh, so to bring all of that together, we've got the scenario in which player 2 lived, that's the free role where we don't even have to play the game. We're adding that to the, prob to the scenario in which player 2 died, as we derived on the previous um, slide there. It feels like we, we're at a stage where we should be able to begin to generalize. And indeed we can. Uh, so let's check this. Let's check this formula out. So the probability instead of p3 living, if we call the player j, where j is a value between three and m, we get the contribution from player two, and we carry that forward for all future players. Player six, player sixteen, both have all have this contribution from player two. We then have the contribution from our, our, ourselves. The idea that if player two, uh, if player j minus one is dead. J minus 1 and all of the people before him have gotten me to node k. What is my likelihood of living from node k onwards? So this formula here is exactly the same as this stuff in the brackets with q equal to 0. If you imagine q is equal to 0, 
for a moment, you'll see that, uh, and j is equal to 3, you'll see that this is just k minus 1, and this thing down the bottom is a 1. Uh, and so, yeah, just to label that, this is the scenario where player 2 lived, and this is the cumulative survival uh, of player 3 uh, onward plus uh, the effort of j themselves. So um, here in the diagram, for example, player 6, standing on something like node 10, after uh, five deaths have happened, the fifth death, ha death, death happened on node 10, four deaths happened before that, and what you'll find is that this combinatorial thing is telling you the number of combinations, uh, the uh, patterns in which um, the, the four deaths uh, can happen on k minus one nodes. Uh, so this is a, a formulaic way to derive the number of combinations as opposed to having to count them all uh, manually. Um, and I think it's this that gives rise to the intuitive kind of complexity of solving this problem. I'm ahead of my I'm ahead of my diagram. I'm ahead of my diagrams, but um, hopefully you guys uh, picked up what I meant by that. So here's the results, and we have this fascinating uh, behavior. This is amazing graph. Uh, I, I was really blown away when this dropped out of uh, Excel when I, when I plugged these formulas in. Here's our player 1 and our player 2 stats that we saw before. And as you can see, the situation for player 3 is substantially better. Uh, we rise to uh, 0.06 of a percent instead of 0.007, so nearly tenfold. Sadly, it's still 1 in 1,000-ish, whatever that is. Uh, one, it's, it's worse than 1 in 1,000. Uh, but things begin to sort of geometrically ramp up. Player 4 is nearly getting up to 1% chance of survival. Player 5 has a greater than 1% chance of survival, and then things really begin to rocket. Player 6 has 4% or 5%, player 7, 12%, player 8, 24%, player 9, 40%, and we get this, what I call, a, what I would describe as a sigmoidal pattern. Now, here's the fascinating thing. Um, once 15 players have tried to cross the bridge, uh, it's almost mathematically impossible for player 16 to die uh, because of the overwhelming li overwhelmingly high likelihood that the game has been solved by then. Uh, so the contribution from uh, all of the deaths of the previous players will mean that player 16's game probably won't even have to be run. And actually in the episode, um, player 16 actually doesn't end up making any decisions uh, in terms of leaping from uh, one uh, node to the other. I did extend this table down to player 19, and I have confirmed and verified that these equations generate a value of 100% for player 19. Uh, with 18 players having gone before him, it's mathematically impossible for the bridge not to have been solved before he embarks on his journey. At player 18, it is still technically possible that 17 people died uh, before you, and you're standing on node 17, uh, having to make a 50-50 guess on node 18. All right, uh, finally uh, entered into the Excel spreadsheet some different values of P, and unsurprisingly what this does is it pushes the curve from to the left and to the right. So as you increase the likelihood of tempered glass up to 75%, player five now has a 50% chance of living, uh, as opposed to what we saw before, which was a 1% chance of living. Okay, as you make the tempered glass rarer, things start to get really, really bad. Player 8 goes down to a 5% chance of living, uh, as an example there. Uh, and if you send it to at a ridiculously low level you, of 25%, even player 16 uh, and 15 uh, have a very tangible chance of death, noting though still that player 16 is right up in the 80s uh, in terms of the, the, the chance of, of, of that player surviving. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll end back on the table there. I, final word, I am a mathematician by training, but this work has not been peer-reviewed, so uh, if uh, anyone ha has spotted any gremlins in my narrative, or worse yet, any uh, carry-the-one problems or, or, or other logical uh, problems from a probability theory perspective, I would uh, appreciate uh, constructive negative feedback, and uh, I'd be happy to do an errata. I might even, if I have to, I'd film the thing again, but I, uh, I'm hoping that won't be necessary, and I think, um, I think I've nailed it here. So if you're still with me, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and uh, I'll see you again soon. Cheers.